2 Timothy chapter 4. Looking forward to uh, just a very, very succinct message this evening that I trust will have some practical, uh, philosophical application for each of us, just in the way that we think as believers, the way we look at life and, uh, and in our outlook toward others. And uh, boy, this, this book is packed, is it not? The Word of God is just full, 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 not only uh, of truths, but of examples for truths. Are you there in 2 Timothy chapter 4? Well, please look down, if you will, with me to verse 16. And uh, that will not be the scripture uh, that, we'll, that we'll focus on this evening. I mean, I'm sorry, I was going to say verse 14, we'll not, and we'll read down verse 17. But verse 14 and 15 are not the focus, they just kind of lead us into our context. And uh, we'll read 14 down to verse 17. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And then, let's read verse 18 because it concludes, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this portion of this letter that the apostle wrote. And God, I just thank you for the application, the reasons that these things are written to Timothy and why they were uh, so valuable and so important. I pray that you would help us to see how to apply them. Not, not God from a slanted angle or a particular personal viewpoint, but generally speaking accurately according to your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. We preached that message a few a uh, couple of months ago, and we won't spend a lot of time going there again, but it's an interesting study to look at Alexander. It's interesting just to look at the way that the Apostle Paul specifically by name mentioned the individual, actually mentioned the individual's name and uh, particularly what he'd done. And you ask the question, what was Paul doing? Was he trying to build a campaign against Alexander and get people in the church on his side make sure that Alexander got put in his place? Well, actually... Uh, the response that Paul gave and the fact that the Holy Spirit of God permitted him to pen this in a letter which was inspired and preserved as the Word of God, uh, I think there are a couple things we could assume. First of all, it's not just Paul in the flesh venting about Alexander the coppersmith. What Alexander the coppersmith had done to Paul I had caused it was evil and had caused great personal hurt. And believer, friend, if you don't do right by the brethren... Uh, don't think that it is only you that's involved. You hurt people. You hurt people when you don't do right by them. What, what, what would have been done wrong to the Apostle Paul? Well, certainly in context here, he's, he is uh, referring to his chain or his bondage, his imprisonment. And it seems as though Alexander the coppersmith had done something that made his situation worse. And he really ought to have been a person from a brethren perspective that should have uh, been an encouragement to Paul, and he was the opposite. Uh, certainly it seems as though he kicked Paul while he was down. It was Paul was in a bad place, and when he needed a friend, when he needed someone to help him, uh, when he was uh, in prison because of preaching the gospel, Alexander the coppersmith either betrayed him or certainly abused the situation for his own benefit. And what he did to Paul was evil. And Paul's response was, let God, you know, the Lord rebuke him. He was not saying, you know, God be merciful to Alexander uh, the coppersmith. He said, the Lord reward him according to his works. In other words, God give him what he deserves. It's precisely what he's saying. Now, in verse, by the way, if you're looking at imprecatory prayers in the New Testament, there is one. There is one. There's one where Paul, you know, just asked the question, uh, is it okay for a Christian to pray for something to happen to someone else? In other words, for judgment or something to come on someone. And uh, I believe if, you're, if the Lord knows your heart and uh, you're right before Him, I believe the answer is certainly it is. And here's really the reason why. He said, of whom be thou aware also. You know, the problem is with evildoers 
in the brethren or evildoers among the brethren is if they wrong one, they'll wrong another. If they harm one, they'll harm another. And so it's good for them to have consequences so that they may be exposed for what they are. And Paul said, look out for this guy. He just he marked him. He put a warning on him. He said, watch out for Alexander the coppersmith. He did me evil, and uh, you know that means he'll do you evil. By the way, <laughs> when you know when you know of a believer, uh, either just using other believers, I mean just using them, taking, allowing them to give or provide for or take something from them, and they're not really being a giver themselves, and you know they do it to you and they do it to someone else, there's a certain point when you need to say, user, this guy's a user, and watch out for him because he'll get you too. Uh, why? Because the things that we are, that we have aren't our own. They, don't, they belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's a matter of stewardship. And Paul is saying, what he did to me, I don't want to see happen to anyone else because it is harmful to the work of Christ. Well, that isn't really so much our message this evening. Uh, now Paul mentions something else from a broader sense, and certainly I do not think that he is accusing uh, Timothy of this. I don't, I don't necessarily think it was possible for Timothy to be the guy that was able to stand with him. But notice this about Paul, and I want to just give you some thoughts or some insight on this truth because you'll find this out if you haven't already in life. There are times you'll find when you're all alone. When it comes to men, you'll find that there's nobody with you. You'll find, oh, I, I, I was with people, but turns out I thought, I thought everybody agreed with me. I, I spoke on behalf of everyone. I stood for everyone, but no one standing with me. And you'll find that this is true in life. Verse 16, he said, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Now, I could preach a thundering message this evening about how wrong it was for individuals to have forsaken Paul and how you ought not forsake the man of God. But I just want to tell you something. It's just a fact. That's what happened. And it's a fact that that's what happens. Do you hear me tonight? Listen, my friend, if you're looking to men for faithfulness, if you're looking to men to be faithful to you, you'll be soundly disappointed. And if you're going to judge God on the standard of what men do, you'll go away from the Lord. You'll go away from the Lord. Yeah. If individual's faithfulness is what encourages you, what injects you with energy and, and uh, fortitude and strength and courage, my friend, the day will come when you'll be entirely discouraged. Why do men that are serving God, why do ladies that are serving God burn out in the ministry? I'll tell you exactly why. Because of this. Because they're hoping that others are standing with them. They're looking, uh, as the, the picture is, they're looking like Moses when he couldn't hold his arms up <coughs> for people to hold their arms up. And you'll find out some days you need your arms held up and you'll look around and your arm will be going down. You'll be like, hey, can you help me? People are like, uh, you're in trouble, man. I'm out of here. It's really the truth. Um, if you mature and if you have courage, and if you stand for God, you'll have the experience of it. And then you'll respond one way or another. You'll respond, you'll say, Christians are all fake. They're all phonies. They're all hypocrites. Everybody talked a good talk, but nobody's real. And then you'll be fake yourself and quit. I've seen it dozens of times. I've seen individuals take strong stands, do the right thing, and then they looked around and they thought people would say, boy." They thought that the accolades would come and crowds would flock to them. And they looked around and they said, Hey folks, I'm standing. How do you like it? People are like, Yeah, we don't like that. Well, that's a problem. That's going to cause problems. We don't want to have your problems. I'm out of here. And man, people are out of there. <laughs> I was going to give a personal illustration, but I will not. Uh, because an individual name would not stand in a good light. But I have been at times I have been in a place where, you know, somebody needs to do the right thing. Somebody needs to stand up. And I've headed off thinking I'm in a crowd and I've just figured out I can outrun everybody <laughs> because I outdistanced them. There's a lot of cowardice. There's a lot of cowardice. And this particular cowardice was the valuing of individuals' lives. Now let me ask you, let's just look at this, analyze it from the other side of the coin or from a practical perspective. 
If Paul's going to take one for the team, is there any value in somebody else going down too? He's in prison for preaching the gospel. <coughs> well, you know what? Solidarity, man. I'll go to prison too. But on a practical, from a practical standpoint, what help is there in two people being in prison? Think about it a little bit. Think about it. It's a trick question. From a practical standpoint, what help is there in two people being in prison? You know, when Paul and Silas were in prison together, they sang praises unto God. And it seemed like Paul was having a good time. It seemed like Silas was having a good time. There was fellowship. Fellowship's a real encouragement, friend. It's so important to, to fellowship. It's so important to plug into the local fellowship and be faithful to it, to where people know you're going to be there. I'll just tell you practically from a pastor's standpoint, it breaks my heart every time you don't show up. Who? You. I'm talking about you. Every time you don't show up, it just hurts my heart. Every time you're there, it encourages my heart. One or the other, it does one or the other. And you know something? It does the same for every person here. You say, Pastor, I have a good reason not to be there. I know, it still hurts. Pastor, God called me somewhere else. I know, and it breaks my heart. Does it not yours? If people love each other, does the moving from place to place, does it not hurt? What mother is glad when her, her children are serving the Lord and they move away? Oh, you can rejoice for their future, but you're broken hearted for the separation. And the fact of the matter is, is, you know, numbers speaking, if we're talking about, you know, the team and the strengthening of the team, you know, for Paul to go down and the rest of the church to survive, it seems like, you know, it's good for the rest of the people to survive. But as far as Paul's concerned, it would have been a lot better if somebody had been there with him. At least he, when he's talking about when he had to stand, you know, when he had to uh, go to his first answer. Individuals that know the law and the Roman system, a couple of things they say here about this is that, first of all, Paul seemed to know at this juncture that the next time he was going to stand, he's going to die. The, 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 Roman, uh, the Roman government did not have a habit of incarcerating prisoners and keeping them for long-term sentences. The Roman government incarcerated individuals in order to hold them until they were put to death. And that would probably be what it is. Now, you, you of course, as a citizen, Paul had the right to a trial. But when he went to his first answer, when he had his first trial, it seems, it would seem as though he looked around in the crowd to say, I wonder how many of the brethren showed up today to support me. Maybe if there needs to be a testimony to my good character, or my good witness. I wonder how many are here. Thought somebody come. Thought somebody come. <laughs> you know the feeling? It's like my birthday party every year. I have a big birthday party, big birthday cake every year, and nobody ever shows up to celebrate with me. <laughs> Not really. I forget what my birthday is every year. <laughs> Not, Not Andrew. No, actually, y'all remember better than I do. The reality of it, though, is, is though, you know, it's not a birthday party. It's a hard time. And you're just hoping, you know, people come. Now, how many of the believers do you think had lives to live? 100%. Everybody does, don't they? How many of them had a reason uh, to be somewhere else? 100% of them did, absolutely. And you know, that's where priorities come in. That's where just knowing, you know what, I'm needed. And yes, this is going to cost me. And yes, it could really cost me, but I'm needed. And so Paul here... Uh, in, in the situation with Alexander the coppersmith, he's asking God would reward him according to his works. Uh, but here, you know, in verse 16, he's praying that God, God, that it may not be laid to their charge. He said, God, I want you to reward Alexander the coppersmith according to his works, but I don't want you to uh, give all the slacker Christian brethren what they deserve. It's interesting, isn't it? Because there is a bit of a contrast there. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. I pray God that he may be reward, rewarded according to his works. And then, you know, the brethren didn't do me any good. Listen to me. 
I'm praying, God, that you know he'd be merciful to them or not reward them according to their works or lack of work. If you knew Paul was thinking of you, you'd first be grateful that he prayed for you, but if it were me, I'd be a little embarrassed, wouldn't you? I'd feel a little bit like I was part of the nobody that showed up. Nobody, me, came, nobody helped. You know, what do we do about this? I pray, God, that it may not be laid to their charge. What do we do about this? Well, think. Think sometimes. I want to tell you something. Sometimes I just don't think. Sometimes, you know, I think too fast. And I don't consider the entire thing. And it just helps sometimes to really think about what my actions mean or my inactivity means. To actually just think it all the way through. Just think. Think, believer. You know, a lot of times we don't, do we? When we're coming up with an excuse, how quick are we to excuse ourselves, particularly in absentia? How quickly are we to, to let something come up? Things come up quickly, don't they? Something's come up. Is something that uh, we seem to allow for rather readily. And the reality of it is, is that when something is an important priority, it ought to really be something in order for us not to be in a place of encouragement. And Paul here is just very, very plainly confessing that he's discouraged. He's just saying, I'm just discouraged. The brethren have discouraged me. They really let me down. How many of the brethren did that on purpose? Well, Alexander the coppersmith did. He did. But the rest of them? I don't really think they did it on purpose, do you? I think they, they accepted the illogic quickly. You know, there's no point in two of us having problems. Well, actually there could be. It could be that the Apostle Paul needs encouragement. And it might be worth whatever you go for, go through for him to have it. I hope I don't forget that. You know, I've preached so many Bible messages, I've learned so many Bible truths that I forget a lot of things. I just do. You know, I, I, I realized this some years back when I realized how bad my memory actually is. When I read uh, college and seminary papers that I wrote on doctrines and different truths, and I thought, man, this is fantastic. Wish I'd known this years ago. <laughs> and, you know, and I wrote it. <laughs> I wrote the paper. I thought, man, this. This ought to be published. This is good. I'm reading my own writing, and I'm thinking, man, I don't even remember writing this. So our memories are poor. And sometimes I just think, God, help me, help me not to forget this tidbit. Help me not to forget this particular truth. Because this is one that's pretty practical. How practical? Well, supposing. Supposing in a small local church. <clears throat> supposing God was raising up a young leader, maybe a young man or young lady to lead a ministry in particular. And supposing uh, they're new at it and they already um, they already struggled with the question of whether or not could use, God could use them. You know, in their mind, their question is, God, am I, you know, I, I, you know the, the Moses thing, who am I? Supposing they're struggling with who am I? And so they go out to be used. Maybe it's to teach a Sunday school class. Maybe it's to, uh, maybe it's to lead a soul-winning program. Maybe it's to do a particular evangelistic outreach, and they go to do it, and nobody shows up. They maybe prepare to teach something, and nobody comes to hear them teach it. it discourages them like you wouldn't believe. It just does. You know, when I leave town and I ask somebody in our church who really wants to serve, maybe to teach a Sunday school or preach, and um, something comes up so that the people that normally are in the services are not. You know what the person who's there thinks? 
they knew I was going to speak tonight, and that's why they didn't come. Isn't that so? How many of you have taught and felt that way when someone didn't come? Now, I know that's the reason you don't come when I preach, but the reality of it is, is that that's part of the job for me. But what about, what about somebody young in the faith? You know, I think that there are individuals who uh, are discouraged by the brethren because of this. We ought to think about that. I remember in the early years of our ministry, when I'd go out of town, I had to sneak away. I didn't even tell our church I was leaving because I knew that if I did, that the regulars wouldn't come. And you know, if you're not used to preaching or speaking, it takes a lot more work to prepare. It's just a lot more work. Uh, somebody asked me, Pastor, how long should it take me to prepare my sermon? I say, well, if you're preaching something you don't know, you've got to learn it first. If you already know it, then you need to uh, pray and be led on how to present it. There's a big difference between somebody that has a grasp of the Scripture and has already studied it and knows and somebody who's never even learned it before. And so take as much time as you need to be able to teach it. That's a lot of time for some folks. I've met guys that tell me, I, I prepare for each service for 40 hours. And I think, well, I speak five times a week. That would be only 200 hours of sermon preparation. <laughs> What's that? 168 hours in the week. Yeah, there's only 168 in the week. Yeah. So, thanks for knowing that. I don't know how many hours. There are in the week. It's always good to have somebody with a brain like Brother John's. <laughs> you know, think about that. Think on it, will you? And so, uh, when somebody prepares or does something and we can't, and we can't have the time for them, you know, it's discouraging. And you say, well, pastor's terrible what they did to Paul, leaving him all alone like that. It really is, I agree. But uh, everybody did. <clears throat> Everyone did it. So statistically speaking, every one of you would. That's how the stats bear out, isn't it? When it comes to betrayal, we, we all would, would have. All the pastors, all the lay people, all the apostles, all the evangelists, they all let Paul just go to trial by himself. And that was a terrible thing to do. And Paul prayed for God's mercy for it. I think it would be a good step in the right direction for us to have the kind of character to be concerned about things like that. It's mentioned in the Scripture not because Paul just wants to whine and complain. It's mentioned in the Scripture so we can learn by it. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Let's profit by it. Okay? Uh, just one last thought here as we finish up tonight. Uh, Paul said, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. The second thought this evening. Just stand anyway. There's somebody who's more loyal, more faithful, and will never forsake you. And you'll never be alone. And that ought to be your motivation. When you stand and you find out you're alone, remember for whom you are standing and remember that He's worthy and that He never forsakes you. How do some people never seem to be discouraged? I like reading missionary stories and biographies sometimes. I'll ever read the story of, uh, is it Adonai or Judson? Or no, it's Hudson, was it? Hudson Taylor. That was on the mission field for how many years before he had his first convert? It was, um, what? Judson was seven years. How many? Seven? Adoniram Ad Judson was seven years. Yeah. Seven years. What about Hudson Taylor? Something more closer on that. Yeah, it was it was years. I mean, literally being on the mission field, you're being sent, you're receiving support, and you've gone overseas, and you're learning a language. And it wasn't until really the end of his life. And at the end of his life, uh, today, if you go to Myanmar, you'll find all kinds of believers there. There are a lot of pagans there, but there are a lot of believers there. And they can trace their heritage back to the man that God sent them. But he didn't have his first convert until the end of his life after his wife had died and after, really, he'd come to the conclusion that he was a nobody and God was never going to use him. And then the first people started getting saved, and now today there are a lot of believers in Myanmar in Burma. What of it? What made him stand? in that way. The Lord stood with him and he knew it. Now friend, you have that kind of relationship with God. 
so you know God's with you? Because that's what really matters. There's two sides of the coin here today, isn't there? On the one hand, it's really shameful that the believers didn't stand with the Apostle Paul. On the other hand, ultimately, it didn't matter for Paul because he knew there was one who would stand with him. And he wasn't the kind to quit or be discouraged. You say, Pastor, well, that's where we separate the men from the boys and we find out what you're made of. We don't do that with babies and toddlers in real life, do we? If they can't survive on their own, then they don't deserve to survive. We don't treat, we don't treat uh, children that way, do we? We don't treat babies that way. We don't treat toddlers, toddlers that way. Why do we do it with, with baby Christians? It isn't right. It isn't God's way. But hear me now. Even if people don't stand with you, if you're standing with God, He's there. He'll never forsake you. And He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. It's wonderful to have a Savior like that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. For a Christian, can I tell you, God will never let you down. He'll never let you down. Man, I'll tell you, if you serve the Lord, there will be seasons in your life when you'll just get bad news, bad news, bad news, discouraging news, discouraging news, discouraging news. And people that ought to come and encourage you seem like they're the ones that let you know how bad it is. A lot of times. They're the ones that say, well, you know, this isn't working. Uh, no, I don't know how many people have told me, you know, you know, nobody, nobody really wants a church in Fort Lauderdale. Now people are telling me, you know what, you know what, nobody really wants a church in Miami Beach. That's why there's never been one. I've had believers say, well, you know what, you know, either, either, you know, this church needs to take off or, or, uh, you know, maybe it's not God's will to have one. My friend, it's God's will for the gospel to be preached in our area. Mm-hmm. And just because there are greener pastures for all kinds of other believers does not mean that God isn't going to do something here or that there isn't a need here. The, the gospel needs to be preached where it isn't being preached. And we as believers just need to know God's. if God's called us, He hasn't forsaken us. Now, Let's go ahead and analyze that as we finish this evening. Did God Paul call Paul? Did Paul preach the gospel the way God wanted him to? Was he effectively used by God? Yes. Was he popular? I don't think Paul was ever popular. The most influential man in the history of the church in every single century was never popular. He wasn't. He was never liked. He was never popular. Now, those that were close to him held him in utmost esteem and respect. The other apostles, they, they valued Paul. But by and large, if you were to poll the audience, if you were to vote for Paul in a popularity contest, he'd have maybe a vote out of 100. But if there were someone else to vote for, he wouldn't have any. <coughs> Study the Scripture sometime. Read the way people treated him and the way he was viewed. In a popularity contest, he maybe have a vote in a hundred, unless there was somebody else to vote for. Him. That's really the way it was. And in the first century, there was not anyone more influential, more used of God, in the church. And in the second century, in the third century, in the fourth century, in the fifth century, all the way down to this century, the Apostle Paul has been used by God the most effectively in the 21st century, more so than any other person alive or dead. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. Take the Apostle Paul and the way God used him out of your New Testament. What do you have? Well, a little bit, (laughs) but not much. You don't have anything about the church, really. You don't have anything about the polity or the about the uh, foundation or the function or the uh, makeup of the church. You don't have anything about doctrine. You just don't really have any doctrine, any sound teaching. You don't have a lot of, of interpretation of the Old Testament and uh, just just uh, ex- exposition. You don't have so many things. You don't have, I mean, you, you just could go on and on and on about what would be missing. And uh, he's pretty popular today. I mean, when you talk about being a Pauline theologian, that's pretty popular. But if he were here, you wouldn't like him. 
How do I know that? Well, nobody that knew him like that. Generally speaking, it's a general statement. It's been generally true. And here he is all alone, near, near to his death. And because of his chain, people who ought to stand with him are ashamed. They're out of there. You're out of here too, I can tell you all done, so I better finish up. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for what we learned to this evening. And I pray that you would help us to absorb it. And God, by your help, help us to retain it, to examine our treatment of the brethren in light of what we've learned. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>